So good afternoon, everyone. Today I'll be presenting, uh, is introduced by Marissa, my project, my, this part of my project, which is called Villa Type of Model, Finding a Contradiction in the Context of Poster Italy. So my presentation today wishes to frame this contradiction, and I will be structure the presentation into three main parts, uh, before a more introductory one, which will serve as a theoretical framework. And then the core of my presentation, where we use three case studies, all built in Italy, all built in the post period, all villas by the sea. As James Ackerman has argued, the villa uh, is unique as a paradigm, although it has remained substantially the same since its first appearance in ancient Rome, as it fulfills a need which never alters. This is the need for pleasure, enjoyment and relaxation, which needs to be found away from the city. And in its famous book, tra he traced the genealogy of the villa. He goes through a number of case studies from ancient Rome. For example, he starts with the villa by Pliny the Younger, the first ever documented, to the Renaissance example, like the Villa Medici, where the figure of the architect as a full-time professional starts appearing with Giuliano da Sangallo, and with it the need of showcasing status and power through the ingenious aesthetics and structural solutions. To the closer example developed in the 18th and 19th century when the villa becomes an available commodity, in doing so arguing that this building can be classified as a type. In my research, I put the accent on the element of leisure and I look at villas intended as residences away from the city, and mainly on the coast, as the ancient Roman intended them, as villa suburbane. Adopting a synchronous perspective here is adopted. This perspective allows examples from the most distant past and the recent present to be compared based on their form and going beyond the human, economic, political, and religious motives usually attributed to them. This is to find, in other words, the structural analogies between buildings, to boil them down to an essential idea, as Ar Aris has argued. So this process is really necessary for a building like a villa, which is by definition a building that wishes to express its uniqueness, as it is the product of the creativity of the architect and the client. There is in fact hardly a moment in the history of architecture when villa were less innovative than other architectural type. So therefore villas came in different forms throughout history, but what is constant is the idea of the villa, in other words the ideology attached to it, the myth so firmly rooted in this building that becomes an incontrovertible truth. Some Marxist scholars have interpreted this term as the means by which the dominant class reinforces and justifies the social and economic structure and its privileged position within it, while obscuring its motivation from itself and others. In this sense, the villa, as argued by Bentman and Mueller as well, is by essence a paradigm of ideology, a myth of fantasy through which, over the course of millennia, a person in a position of privilege was able to expropriate land through the exploitation and care of the laboring class in both building it and serving it a negative utopia. Having said that, what makes it all a bit confusing is when the villa type becomes commodified, mm -hmm. which is a process that happens as we have seen it in the 18th and 19th century and continues until today, a moment in which the villa ideology is democratized and accessible to the growing body of lower middle class city dweller. The villa becomes a commodity, and so it, does the ideology die since the idea of class structure become less strong? I would argue that the continuous production of villas and its peak production in the post period in Italy was instrumental in keeping its ideology alive. And despite one would think that the commodification of this building would help alleviating class struggle, I argue its production and reproduction, a term which I define as villa mania, helped to construct a dream to aspire to, therefore reinforcing the status quo. So today we'll be presenting three case studies. Villa Balmen, which is located in the center of this map in Elba, La Saracena, 70 kilometers north of Rome, and Casa Rosio, Villa Rosio, near Genoa. So I will try to understand whether these three villas can ascribe to the concept of type and model, and I will try to move between these two concepts. And I will also try to express the overarching argument of my thesis, which is, as I said, that the proliferation of these villas was actually the product of an implicit project carried out by a number of specific political strategies uh, by a government of priests and democrats, which ruled Italy for 50 years after the war. And I will use each of these villas to illustrate one of these strategies. So despite the villa is a building which has survived through centuries, I argue that the specific context of post Italy was instrumentalized in creating a model for a new emerging middle class, thus making it misleading to define the villa as a type or model. And I'm also ultimately trying to show these high examples of architecture, which have become the peak of the iceberg and were used as models to imitate as a type of domesticities. So starting with Villa Balmain was the product obviously of a number of uh, social and economic uh, factors in conjunction, but the two visible actors were 
the client, Pierre Balmain, uh, who was the head of a fashion house in Paris, and the architect Leonardo Ricci, who was 40 when he designed his villa. Um, and they met almost by chance because the, the client needed an Italian architect to build uh, his holiday residence in Elba. And when looking at the plan, one is confronted with a sense almost of disorientation for the unusual layout, possibly inspired by the design of some of the garments produced in Balmain Fashion House. The house is developed on different levels, uh, and it starts as a kind of top-down type of plan in the sense that you start from the top and descend down. As you see on the, on the left-hand side, I've only shown two plans here, so you would enter and, and then the sort of elliptical staircase will guide you through different spaces, living room, dining room, two bedrooms, and then in the bridge structure, you will find kitchen and, and bathroom, and then you would descend down to the pool. In this lecture, I would like to stress three main construction elements which characterize this architecture. The elliptical staircase, for example, which is a, is a reinforced concrete pillar, which is clad in local stone, in the same stone that clads actually the, the steps of the staircase. And this is actually showing itself a, a bit of a contradiction, which is a sort of symbolic of post-Italian architecture. So on the one side, the high technological uh, invention uh, of, of concrete applied to domestic buildings, and on the other, the looking back at like traditional construction strategies. And then the sprang mass, the tie beam that actually projects outward, which is one of the like main structural elements of the house, uh, which almost looks as if the house would, uh, would fly away in a way. And finally, the bridge structure at the back of the house, which is actually an essential structural element of support, which sort of links back this villa to the larger infrastructure project happening in Italy, as we mentioned before, like infrastructure motorway connecting the north and south of the country. So by being the product of architecture and engineering, this house is the perfect example of bespoke technology applied on a private residence. Providing, proving the idea of by Ackerman that there was never a moment in history where the villa was not innovative. Mm -hmm. This example also supports one of the arguments in my thesis, and this hypothesis is that the Christian Democratic actively reinforced the construction sector through the support of the artisanal dimensions. So supporting bespoke strategies instead of prefabricated ones by, in a way, fragmenting the construction sector. And while at the time, and this was also to try and avoid workers unionizing in factories, so really actively supporting this sector. And here, what I'm trying to show as well is that while during this, this period, there were larger housing projects happening, like in Akaza, throughout the country, with uh, the, the end of Inakaza, as you can see in this graph, there was actually a decrease in employment uh, in, in larger, in, in, let's say, uh, over 1,000 people type of construction companies and an increase in the late in the 70s of companies with less uh, employees. So I'm also trying, to, in a way, to trace the connection between these large the labor transfer between these large projects and the smaller projects like villas. So ultimately, Villa Balmain presents all the characteristics within itself, which would ascribe these villas, a typical villa, the element of the view, the innovative technological elements applied in its construction due to the presence of a patronage hiring notable, a notable architect, somehow linking it to previous examples seen in history, like Villa Medici, for instance. So moving on to the second example, I would like you to analyze the concept of villa as a blueprint. And I'm taking Villa La Saracena, which I said is located 70 kilometers from Rome. And I would like to discuss the way in which a villa becomes a blueprint, uh, or in other words, how would high model of architectural quality would percolate on other models. Luigi Moretti was the architect behind this project. A generation older than Leonardo Ricci was a well-known architect in the 50s. He already designed the Watergate complex in Washington. You can see him here on the left-hand side, grinning over um, this model. <laughs> It is uh, kind of like showing to uh, potential stakeholders. Uh, and he was actually hired as a consultant to this really large um, real estate company called SGI. But he also was doing other projects on the side. And actually, uh, one, one of them was Villa La Saracena, which was also the product of a, lot, a number of influences in his uh, design career, which I'm not going into detail right now. But the building was commissioned by, uh, a, by a journalist for his daughter. Uh, and as you can see here, um, the, the plot is the one on the right hand side in the center. It was a long and narrow plot and uh, it was actually bought by the client who bought this plot and the one on the left hand side. And there was a construction of La Saracena in the middle and then the construction of a villa for the client himself, which was called La Califa and was completed in 67. And then the one on the right hand side, La Moresca, which was actually gonna be the architect holiday residence. But unfortunately, he passed away before the house was completed, hence the name, the unfinished triptych of Santa Marinella, the location of this project. 
So Moretti decided to utilize the first meter of the lotto to create an open air atrium with falches, kind of looking back at the tradition of ancient Roman uh, villas in a way. The, the villa really uh, tried to connect the street to the sea, creating the sense of promenade, as you can see here. So the, the villa is almost like an atrium in itself, and you would have uh, what you see on the left hand side, um, two sp spiral staircase that lead to on the one side to the rooftop and on the other side to um, additional bedrooms. And then you would proceed to an inner garden, uh, the kitchen, and eventually the living area, the dining, overlooking the sea. So the building has been recently renovated, and photographs uh, give the illusion of an uninterrupted view towards the sea that the, photo the, photographs, uh, that the photograph wanted really to portray. The villa has always been, uh, since history, a speculation device. But the extent of its commodification and proliferation has changed permanently the Italian coastal landscape. And Santa Marinella is a prime example. So in a way, uh, we see here these illusions, which is strongly opposed to the reality of where, San where La Saracena is located. And the extent of urbanization could have been avoided. In 1962, Fiorentino Sullo, Minister of Public Works of the left fringe of the Christian Democrats, proposed a law which was intended to protect land from a regulated speculation, in other words, from parceling in Italian lottizzazione. So his idea was actually to allow land to be, uh, first of all, there, was a there would be a national planning framework for the whole country, and that could, could be managed by different regions. And the regions had the power in, itself, in the, themselves to decide whether to give that land, you know, either to be protected or to give it to, for social housing or for other type of development. How unfortunately, the leadership of the Christian Democrats gave in to the pressure from the right wing side of the party, which had tight links to large landowners, construction companies. So Sulo was also ostracized by his own party on, accu on accusing of wanting to deprive the Italian families of their homes, using offensive and discriminatory claims that because of his homosexuality, she, he was opposing to the very own idea of nuclear family model. So despite of the implementation of other laws, unregulated construction continued, both in the city centers on the coast, making acquiring a plot and building a house much easier for a larger, um, larger strata of population. And this graph obtained by uh, the statistical shows there's actually a large number of, of uh, second homes being constructed, of which most of them are actually vacant throughout the year. So in La Saracena, we also witness really the hybridization from villa to Villetta or smaller villa, so the, the kind of achievable, uh, cheaper um, alternative to it, which is also very visible when looking at the finish uh, that we see uh, percolating from the higher model to other models surrounding this villa. So a closer look to the neighboring anonymous Villette surrounding La Saracena demonstrate how this coating became pervasive and slowly started symbolizing a very specific idea of the architecture of the holiday home and of the Mediterraneanness. In this sense, when analyzing the building of La Saracena, going beyond the view towards the sea and looking at the context in which it sits, it is clear that one is faced with the reality that this building sits between the idea of type and model. Model for Catrimed can see is the identical plastic repetition of an object. This is obviously not the case for La Saracena and its surroundings, as we don't see here a duplication of the building itself, but the extent of the Saracena characteristics, starting from the treatment of the facade to the treatment of the volumes in relation of the landscape, it is here hybridized and, and it percolates. Lottizzazione here is what made this process happen. And lastly, I would like to look at the last case study, Villa Rosio, and looking at the concept of villa's refuge, in other words, villa's class refuge. And the analysis I'll do here is aimed at looking at the role that artifacts like villas can play in the urbanization of the coast when larger stakeholders are involved. So here I would like to also look at how villas were instrumentalized in the creation of a new model of domesticity. And I will take as an entry point Villa Rosio, which is located in the Arenzano Pine Grove. The Arenzano Pine Grove is an area near Genoa, which uh, uh, is a very small town, uh, town of Arenzano, overlooking the Ligurian Sea. It was actually, the plot was owned by one family, one aristocratic family, uh, which actually replanted all the pine grove after the war because uh, the, the, the timber was used uh, just throughout the war, so they needed replanting. Um, and in a way, it was actually really closely connected to the motorway. Therefore, it made this, this place quite easily reachable from cities like Milan, Turin, and Genoa itself. 
the owners of uh, the Pine Grove out of Arenzano decided to actually create, in a, cer in a certain way, a real estate company, which was called Shemadis, a maritime center for resorts, uh, in, in a really way translate, uh, translated in English. And they had a vision uh, of transforming Pineta into an elitist villa, uh, sorry, village, uh, mainly constituted by villas. And they actually asked uh, the most famous sort of um, emerging architects from Milan and from that period to actually take part into not just the master plan, but also the design of these villas. And here we see the president of uh, Cemadis, and then at the bottom we see a picture with Vico Magistretti, the architect of Villa Rosi, smoking a cigarette at a party in Arenzano. So the Cemadis uh, company uh, gave, the, as I said, gave this master plan to two architects, uh, Gardella and Zanuso. And then they started sort of subdividing uh, this land into the main functions, so the, the sort of zoning. So the idea was to have a main infrastructure access and then leave the rest sort of free. The main idea was to have only one fifth of the original area, which counted 150 hectares, free of construction, with the idea of having to protect the pine grove. The top had a golf court, uh, tennis, and uh, all sorts of amenities because it was a flat area. Uh, and then there would be four major points which were sort of like the com communal uh, facilities were located. There was also a rule that construction shouldn't be allowed as, uh, below 70 meters from the sea. And that would have to sort of protect the villas in terms of privacy, both from mainly from the sea. So creating this sense of isolation. And the general plan in, included, uh, all, as I said, infrastructures, but also and mainly villas. So there were 30 villas constructed on the northeast side of Arenzano. Villa Rosio uh, was actually the first villa ever built, and that's the reason why I chose that one. But there were other villas all built between the 50s and the 60s. And so, uh, in a way, the entire planning of Arenzano was controlled by one private company, who was also the company that was in charge of inspecting works throughout the construction site. And also, in a way, um, the planning was sort of granted more or less after the construction. So it was one of those hybrid cases in Italy, uh, which happened throughout the country. And Villa Rosio was actually, I, I use Villa Rosio because it was actually presented at the SIAM conference in 1958 as an example of Italian architecture. And it received actually a lot of contradictory um, criticism because obviously uh, it wasn't an open facade. It was very introverted with very small openings and a very narrow plot. It was sort of like a tower-like type building with services in the ground floor, dining, living and, and bedrooms and a lot of uh, roof gardens at different levels. And so the reaction was really of, of shock from let's say the more like a European um, um, public attending the CM conference as it was going against the openness of the typical architecture of the modern movement. So the case of Arenzano was also discussed in major specialist magazines, like in these two number of Casabella, which were dedicated to the issue of the coastline. So in 64, um, this issue of like unregulated urbanization after what happened with Fiorentino Sullo starts becoming an issue, but somehow Arenzano is seen as a good example. It's seen as like an example of planning going right, and actually one of the main arguments uh, that Nathan Rogers, the editor of Casabella, used um, was the idea of homo additus nature. So since the pine grove was actually planted by, by humans, therefore the construction should happen. Therefore, it's actually justifiable to allow construction here for speculative gain. What happened in reality was that probably this dangerous argument was also the, case, the, the reason why a lot of other urbanization happened and infiltrated within the pine grove of Arenzano, resulting into a hybrid which has on the one side sort of high examples of architecture and then Palazzini or other, uh, other types of less, or let's say, architectural policy. So Arenzano was probably the only example in post Italy of the involvement of the many so-called design masters, all invited to develop their creativity through the villa type. And this is obviously not a new phenomenon. What is specific here, though, is the conjunction between the elitist dream and the commodification of the villa, which led to extreme urbanization. So the intention of Semadis, this private company, was to ex export a way of living for the Milanese middle class, which was to reinforce, I argue, the ideology of the villa and sort of percolate it to other, uh, of, of the other classes. So um, as I said, the number of architects involved, they interpreted the taste and aesthetics of the newly formed middle class. 
In the recent scholarship of Arenzano Pangrov, the Casarosio and other plans have been celebrated for the capacity of creating a domestic ritualization. Decide by dividing the spaces of the guests and the spaces which are served. Therefore, I argue crystallizing class struggle in one building and in one compound, prompting us to question whether there will be a world without villas being the quintessential symbol of inequality and class struggle. I argue unless the ideology of the escape and dominion is subverted, villas will continue to exist. So differently from Villa Balmen and La Saracena, there at least the layout of the villa, as argued by other scholars, was actually subverted. So in a way, um, it wasn't the typical nuclear family sort of layout, which in, in, in contrast we see here in Villa Rosa, which looks almost uh, canonical, I would say. And so here I, is really domesticity on, on steroids. So I would classify this building as a model, model here not intended as an identical copy of something, but as a code of living, a model of domesticity to accommodate a new social class subject. And so to conclude, it is clear that when looking at the specific context of what I call Villa Mania and Foster Italy, a contradiction between type and model arises. If the villa on the one side, despite its uniqueness and variation, can still be identified as a type, a number of characteristics persist, namely, as I've shown, the innovative technology expressed in a material, uh, the presence of a generous patronage, the relationship with the landscape, and the presence of a view, and the embodiment of class struggle. However, on the other end, I hope I was also able to discuss how going from one example to the other, the notion of a model emerges. In the three case studies, I argue that by various degree the villa moves between one and the other. The continuous production of villas and its peak production in the foster period was instrumental in keeping the villa ideology alive. And despite one would think that the commodification of this building would alleviate class struggle, he says, I actually argue that it sort of uh, reinforces the status quo. And to this is my final slide. So the, the large amount also of trade magazines, which were produced uh, by famous publishing houses like Oakley at the top, producing uh, no less than five manuals or trade magazines on villas, and Gerlich, which in the same years, 55 to 75 roughly, produced uh, other similar books like Villas by the Sea, Villa in the Mountain. They also percolated and distributed this ideology of the villa within and outside a specialized pu public, therefore becoming the most visible and tangible proof of what otherwise remained the implicit project of Villa Mania. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michaela. Um, uh, to open up a discussion, so if there are comments, thoughts, questions. Maybe one question. You, I think it was a really fantastic presentation. Thanks so much. Yeah. Really interesting work. Um, you, there was one thing I was hoping you could repeat. Uh, you at the beginning you talked about obscuring from its from itself from its own inhabitants of villas. Can you can you repeat this? <laughs> Can you talk about this idea? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm still familiarizing myself with the kind of Marxist critique of ideology, and this is sort of borrowed from Bentman and Mueller, who are two scholars that wrote about um, sort of the project of villas in 16th century Veneto. And I think in a way what they meant, if, if I'm not wrong, is that the decoration and the architectures, but also the use of uh, paintings within the villa itself, um, they sort of help in a way masking the real project that is at stake. So um, yeah, I, I guess that's what I understood from it. So the the architecture in itself is so, um, uh, no, I don't want to use the word like pervade, but like um, almost distracting from the reality yeah. of what's happening there, which is uh, obviously land expropriation. So it is obscuring, but obviously, um, having servants in a villa is actually a quite a visible proof of it. So maybe obscuring is a, is a strong word for it. I mean, in a way, you can apply the same uh, people also to temporary villas or for you in preparation of this. And I think that a common thread is the idea of pastoralism. Yeah. So the idea yeah. that uh, the villa is kind of, uh, I would, yeah, ideal, the good life, oh, the image yeah. of the good life. But of course, uh, which obscured the fact that could be, I mean, as in Andrea Rizzano, example was very clear. To build villas, you have to do a lot of heavy infrastructure. You have to, uh, you know, I mean, you mm -hmm. urbanize. Urbanize, yeah. A lot. Yeah. 
the ideology serves to mask uh, this aspect of the villa. Uh, and I, yeah, the villas, as you show, often comes with localization. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's partly. And actually, another point I didn't mention uh, is obviously the the villa in itself. Um, it's a it's a symbol and uh, of how the life could be away from the city. So seeing the city as this place of tension, of conflict, of uh, pollution, and as we see now, um, and actually retreating to the Ar Arcadian countryside, almost in a way to liberate yourself from that condition. But it, that's obviously an illusion in the sense that to have villas, you need to have infrastructure. And villas are often built with the surplus generated by the city, but it's somehow um, this ideology of the escape, which we obviously have also experienced during the pandemic, I argue, uh, this kind of sense of wanting to uh, to leave the city and to leave what it represents. Yeah, I just, I think, yeah, it's super interesting. I just, I wonder, <clears throat> I think the relationship between the architects and the patron is also really interesting because I'm, I'm asking myself the same question about the architect's role <laughs> or the architect as perhaps obscuring their own participation in that yeah. project through the, the way that they compose the architecture or through mm -hmm. the way they, so for example, you know, I, I'm not, I mean, on one hand, the I'm not an expert in villas, but the the escape. But on the other hand, um, this sort of ideology of improvement, per, perhaps mm -hmm. the ideology of progress, yeah. um, the ideology maybe in an early earlier villas of this return to the ideal nature that can only be achieved uh, by through this patronization. So, so yeah, I find I find the compositional aspects incredibly interesting, and and as they as we transition to the contemporary, um, there's a really interesting, for me, question about this composition, this patronization of the composition on the part of the architect and their own, basically almost their own conversation between the architect and the patron um, mm -hmm. as, a, as a means of patronizing also an a, a certain production of a, of a kind of image. And a kind of freedom, no? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing that you're you're, you're the, the patronizing of a certain freedom in the composition, mm -hmm. and so not only in progress and sort of technological means of of producing these, which I, that I think is a really important and interesting conversation, um, but also purely the representational or expression, the the aspects of the of the villa that are mm -hmm. advertising themselves through the will of the architect, and then onto the city somehow so mm -hmm. what there was one plan where you showed i think there were three were these three villas on the sea all designed by the same art yes correct um sorry let me go back okay yeah i was it's uh yeah uh here here yes so these are designed right. from the same architect who was designing watergate um, one, one other strange kind of question i had was whether at some point in the history of the villa, the villa becomes a caricature that sort of much more explicitly exposes the villa's historical uh, program, in a sense. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's, because there are some situations, some moments in here where I think you're you're suggesting that, and it, 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 would, it would be nice to draw that out even more. So, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mikhail. I was really, uh, I have to say, spectacular presentation, and I particularly really enjoyed actually this moment where you, where you really try to position the the villas, you know, in between uh, type and model. I thought that that was really really clever. But that, of course, comes with a question for me uh, that I have to say it's a question that I ask myself time and again the past few years, also dealing with uh, students trying to design villas in very, very diverse uh, contexts. So we know that today, where my mind goes if I hear villa is probably the Emirates or. Dubai or something like that, where everything we design is, you know, by default a villa. And of course, my question is very banal, but I think quite important. What do we mean exactly by villa? Mm -hmm. And uh, whether at a certain moment uh, there isn't just a term that has completely shifted in typological terms. Now, I have to qualify what I'm saying, because I think that if we take into account the villa as a political product, uh, and you gave a very crisp definition of that, and I do think it endured. So the same kind of aspirational status symbol role that he had for the Romans, he still has today. So I think if we buy, if you consider the villa as a, a political uh, type, I would say, yes, there's continuity. But then there's also obviously an environmental level, like we were discussing this morning, and there, I don't think there's continuity, we mm -hmm. can discuss it more in detail. 
Uh, then there's a special organization diagram and so on and so forth. To me, what is wonderful about your, your topic is that it really brings forward to me this question, how many layers are there when we discuss something at a type, as a type, and in which cases these layers align or not? Because I think the case of the villa might be an interesting case study where these registers don't always align. Because I do think that in the story that you are telling us, there have been moments of uh, really of rupture and of shift where in fact certain parameters that are very important for the villa type in certain eras do not continue further or are disrupted at certain moments. So uh, I think I'm, I'm sure you can argue for continuity of the villa type actually from the Romans to today under some of these registers, but maybe not all of them. And I just want to address maybe one in particular that is really the environmental question, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for a long time, you know, from the Romans to Palladio, uh, you know, throughout the Medici, it, it really came uh, with an idea of owning and controlling land attached to it, right? Something that is super striking for me here is how small that plot of land is. So I'm just going to leave that there, but I think actually the way in which the object uh, sits in relationship with the context, uh, for me, when I think Villa, apart if we go back about, away from the Dubai thing, and that's why I find the Dubai thing really striking, like yours, is in fact, on the contrary, the relationship between object and the piece of land that is around it. So maybe that is one of the registers that shifted at a certain moment when the class connotation shifted, right? Yeah. Perhaps, or, or something like that. So I want to leave that question there. The other question that to me is interesting is the question of uniqueness and individuality, because you were mm -hmm. positing it as a, another one of the parameters. How do we recognize if something is a villa? It has to contain innovation and it has to contain some degree of uniqueness, uh, individuality, and especially I would say a monomorphological and an anthropomorphic, almost like correspondence to the, to the owner. It's almost like a portrait of the owner yes. of the villa, right? There's yeah. this kind of... Um, I completely buy it. I think it's a very, very clever, actually, definition. But then at a certain moment, I'm wondering how do we place Palladio in all that? Because mm -hmm. I think that they are the register of social individuation and, you know, recognizing in, in each other a, a collective class of, of landowners is, I think, more important than individuality. So mm -hmm. the use then of the orders, the use of a logic, they could all recognize each other as part of a collective project somehow, right? Yeah. So I think that this kind of di dialectical relationship between individuality, but also being part of a class is interesting because also in your case studies are wildly different, but then again, they are kind of similar as well. So I, I don't know how to phrase that, but I think again, yeah. it's, it's another one of the registers that you're putting forward. So there's a political register, there's an economic register, there's a social register, there's an environmental register, but then there's also formal level uh, register of inventiveness. Maybe that also shifted actually uh, through uh, time. And uh, yeah, I'm maybe going to leave that there, but I thought that, I mean, to me, it's beyond the material, which is fantastic. It's also very interesting that this really puts the finger on the problem with type, right? That there's, it's a, it's a, such a complex bundle of all these different things mm -hmm. and you can have continuity at one level, but at another level at a certain moment, the term is completely re-semantized mm -hmm. and gets to indicate something wildly different, right? Yeah. Because that's like a pretty small piece of land at the end. Yeah, I, I have a question that is completely, completing the questions by Maria. Um, in which way do you create a boundary in your research between uh, uh, villa as unique and the villa as a commodity? Mm -hmm. To me, it's not so clear because are you in fact dealing with some formal aspect of your, in the, in the very large sense of it? Are you dealing with the condition of the of the um, uh, client the relation between the client and uh, the the uh, the designer? Let's let's put like this mm -hmm. because uh, maybe uh, at a certain moment the designer will be not there uh, any anymore. Or um, yes, it, it is in uh, because also in other in, in other themes which are not the villa but in other themes as for instance I don't know row houses mm -hmm. maybe this. Uh, uh, transformation into commodity was maybe also uh, absolutely welcome by the, I, I can yeah. imagine, you know, the, yeah. some modernist, um, you know, uh, uh, adventures. Uh. So really, and in, in, in a way, it's a really technical question mm -hmm. in, in, related to your dissertation. Can I reply to this three or no four? Okay. Um, okay, so the first, so I'll try to reply to all of them together somehow because yes, they're they're connected. Um, so starting from, I would like to start from Palladio. <laughs> so I, I haven't, uh, <laughs> sounds like a statement. Um, I haven't in, included any, I haven't mentioned Palladio uh, for a specific reason uh, because 
uh, as it's been written by lots of scholars, um, Palladian villas are, have a very strong element, uh, or a strong link with the countryside. Uh, they're strongly linked to, to, to sort of farmhouses with the presence of barquesse. So it is villa as a productive enterprise and it is villa as uh, somehow a factory, I would say. Um, and in a way, the project uh, of that villeggiatura, let's say, was analyzed uh, by Ben Pan and Mueller, which I mentioned earlier, as a project, uh, as a sort of solution to the fact that Venice, of course, was losing power in that specific period. So my thesis wishes to look at villas purely for leisure. Mm -hmm. So that's, for me, kind of like one of the main uh, boundaries that I set up set for myself. Uh, and so for that reason, I haven't integrated, I haven't, I, I don't really talk about Palladio, but I mean, I could talk about it in, neg let's say, in the negative. Um, and I really uh, like the idea of disruption that you've mentioned, like maybe that could be a way into um, structuring, because at the moment I structure my thesis into as if it was a project. So it's called How to Build a Villa. So I would like to take case studies um discussing the different phases of construction so starting from the acquire, acquisition of, of the parcel to the building site to then create to the almost like the medialization of that object um and so but finding disruption let's say of uh, of the type throughout um history if it's possible would definitely be a key of interpretation um and obviously for me it's really looking into a, a, a type that i to be honest, I wish we would stop building, if I want to be completely honest with you. Maybe, maybe because I have also uh, been on the side of the design. And I think it's really probably a very enjoyable process because it, it allows you a lot of freedom. And as you said, like uh, the uniqueness of having one client. Um, but in a way, I think it's almost, yeah, I wonder whether they will ever be considered an historical type, whether it would disappear. And so I'm, I will really try to look at the ideology behind it, so the, the dream behind it. And in that sense, maybe I will try to answer to your question, which I think it will be a question that I'll try to answer throughout. <laughs> so I'm at the beginning of my second year, so I still have hopefully a few years to answer that. Um, but I guess I would like to start from yeah the ideology, so the dream to understand why would one want to build a second home? Maybe that's the main question. Because I guess comparing with other contexts in Europe, I think maybe the, I might be wrong in this is a big assumption, but uh, for example, the context of the UK, um, the reason such urbanization as second homes, like the holiday is intended almost as like wilderness, as like experience in nature. Um, I don't know, this is like one of the new reflections I've done in the last few days, almost like, you know, the culture of camping, the culture of like being in nature. Uh, there are always examples of this in the UK, but I think on a, let's say, mass tourism level, the reason this kind of need of wanting to have a second home which at the end of the day remains empty for most of the year. So maybe there is something in there. I don't know. There was one of the... Also, if you can afford it in the UK, you would rather actually situate your family outside of the city. And yeah. then if the husband actually comes into town Monday to Friday uh, to work. Yeah. Having a bachelor of bed actually in the city. Yeah, that's true. Or yeah, for the middle and upper middle classes. Maybe now less, but... Mm -hmm. In this kind of rather traditional context. Right? Yeah, so it's almost really like the idea of property for the holidays that to me it's quite interesting in the context of Italy. And I guess there probably was a similar context. Um, yeah, I'm focusing on Italy. I'm hoping to do some sort of comparison without uh, to make it a bit more of a general discourse. But uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. So. Yeah, no, I think you, as has been said, you address a lot of important questions also in terms of the typology. I mean, one of the things you can wonder is whether we can have a type without a typical plan. Yeah. And yeah. if there are other characteristics that define a type than yeah. just the, the plan, because in that case. And I was also wondering something about what that Pil Vittorio said in the introduction that during the 80s or the 90s, sort of typology became out, came out of fashion. Maybe in that sense, the, the Villa Mania is a kind of avant-garde precursor to what we now consider star architects or contemporary architecture, because it was already a sort of yeah. moment in which architects were liberated or had a kind of freedom from from. Uh, mm -hmm. from and in that sense, maybe I also wonder if what, what would also be nice, maybe is a really sort of extremely formalist Colin Rowe like reading of some of these villas simply yeah. to, to yeah. show how how they 
Yeah, how, how they brilliant compare. they are in their, yeah. in their sculptural or their, their formal quality. Completely, because I think, I mean, uh, this is just a gut instinct, but I think in unconsciously or consciously, tripartition is there in almost all of these cases. Yeah. Even magistrate that is curved onto itself, this is very, it's very obvious that there's tripartition. And I think tripartition is not a quest formal question, it's a question of vistas, obviously, mm -hmm. because once you actually create that kind of the, the vouchers, uh, I mean, you mm -hmm. create a situation where you have actually uh, ac um, ac actual axial visuality. Yeah. But I think Christophe's point to me is crucial. That's why I was asking, you know, what is the minimum actually that you have to define a villa, if there mm -hmm. is a minimum, yeah. especially? Because yeah. I would say to me, this is my, you know, five cents. It has to have five facades. And in your case, the Balman even has six mm -hmm. because you have the one below. Uh, so it cannot be attached to something else and it has to be graspable by the eye in one go so it cannot be a palace right because mm -hmm. the palace gets to a point where it's you know the scale is such that you might not be able to completely you know see it uh which also means that it's tied to one family um yeah but i don't know this is like you know like literally my two cents mm -hmm. it might be wrong uh, it might be just unprecise or it might be also not true or it might have shifted actually through time mm -hmm. so i think christophe's point uh, to me is really crucial because even if we want to go with the idea that the, you of course you can get out of this very easily by saying the villa is a political product there's yeah. no special consistency i will be with you i think it's fine if you if you say if you put it like that mm -hmm. but because as you are saying you're just at the beginning uh, I would try because maybe there is Sorry, something that yeah. is also en enduring with their spatially. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just wanted to add uh, an interesting comment that maybe is not relevant for your paper, your presentation, but it's interesting about you know this the the, the reputation of these architects, that, you know, uh, especially Moretti, but also the others, <laughs> which is uh, that is true that uh, when the discourse on Thai was on its peak, uh, they were the most, especially Moretti hated the uh, architects, especially in Italian universities. I remember a professor of mine really calling him the Palazzinaro because yes. he was really like the uh, architect for rich people designing buildings. But then in the 90s, when in fact the discourse on type uh, collapsed and there is the rise of the new avant-garde uh, colas and, you know, mm -hmm. All of the sudden, Moretti, Caccia Dominioni, Vietti, they become like the super yeah. fashion. And yeah. actually, there is a whole new wave of historical reappraisal yes, there is. Of, of these uh, architects. Yeah. Uh, so there is a revisionism, exactly, we, because the, the 90s is the moment where Italy really completely uh, forget about its kind of conflictual history of the 60s and 70s. Uh, and so this kind of a good life, uh, image of good life becomes again acceptable. And I remember that really at university, almost overnight, people were designing the Sarashen. I mean, like, uh, you know, curves everywhere, you know, mm. like, uh, <laughs> and, and of course, you you know, people see, well, you know, looks like a Zahadi the project. <laughs> so in a way, yes, there are, I think this mom, I mean, of course, maybe it's not really relevant in your thesis, uh, but to me, uh, to be aware that there are these constant moments of revisionism uh, where you know but the ideology of the practice uh, in a way push historians uh, to revisit certain kind of works mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. i think uh, it would be interesting to understand where you position yourself mm -hmm. in this kind of history of of, of historical reappraisal or, or critique because uh, uh, I think today there is, a, especially in Switzerland, there is this cult uh, of uh, Italo modern, uh, and uh, for me there, there there is a clear ideological thing at work there. Yeah, you know the fact that uh, you have all this uh, generation of uh, architects uh, uh, in their fifties, uh, uh, so big boomers, <laughs> Gen Gen X boomers who are in love with this uh, hedonist uh, Italian uh, modernist architecture uh, to me is very symptomatic of something I mean yeah. I, I think you know it could be an, an interesting conclusion or, or footnotes mm -hmm. uh, also not to look at it as a coffee table uh, book yeah exactly but also I mean I yeah. think also on the, yeah. at the level of practice I mean I, I, I you know you see actually there are a lot of even seminar weeks where students are you know they go to see Gardella and all this you know Villa Malaparte mm -hmm. so it, it's it's a kind of modernity I mean there I, I think there is also this architect from Spain I forgot that only yeah. built villas on the coast I forgot yeah. his name but uh, uh, I think Stefan Bates recently published a book about him mm -hmm. but 
this a very comparable approach. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and to me, there is something there, uh, symptomatic, uh, that this kind of architecture that I, when I was a student, I was educated by my Marxist uh, teachers to hate uh, uh, as the end of the architecture, now actually is considered the best uh, of Italian architecture. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a way, Moretti now is a, uh, is considered a virtuoso mm -hmm. of, of design and La Saracena is, a, is now considered a masterpiece, uh, something that in, 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 you know, when I was still, it was considered a kind of pornography, you know, of, uh, also of like a journey kind of, um, yes. please uh, make me the set stage design for yes. the 60s. Uh... Or Wes, yeah, Wes Anderson. <laughs> I'm sure the next movie by Sorrentino would be <laughs> that. <laughs> for sure. So it, in fact, it's been uh, renovated. Yeah. Part, uh, as a soundtrack. Exactly. Saracena sealed by the by the drone. Any last question? Well, last question. Indeed, it's it's not a comment question, maybe, but a comment for the thesis. Uh, maybe you are also already considering, but I I am try I will try to join Maria's and Pierre Vittorio's comments in terms of land, the scale of the land, and also this. Um, this issue of the architect or Villa Mania, I think also Christoph mentioned, because I was thinking it's very important to think about the character of the land, because if we take from Palladio on or up to the model, uh, so these, these were agricultural sites, I guess, right, mainly, because you, you mentioned about three cases and in the thesis mm -hmm. it's more, I guess. So uh, the how the the building code change or how these lands were open to construction, I think is, is, a, is an important question uh, in terms of also uh, to discuss how Villa transforms from the type to model, uh, the, the issue of land and um, mm -hmm. yeah, the parcelization, etc., all these things, and the ownership pattern, of course, of the land. Because, for instance, I, I again, um, when, when I associated with my research or question like how cooperatives acted as an autonomous uh, housing development, uh, eliminating the role of architects, uh, giving the, the role to labor or, or, or inhabitants or residents, mm -hmm. let's say, or property owners or landowners. So then um, the land, let's say, an agricultural land by law could be transformed for a cooperative by an overnight act or uh, mm -hmm. law or decision. Uh, so that a, a, a site including 200 houses could be built there by a cooperative because we had this experience. The second home experience mm -hmm. in Turkey, for instance, is cooperatives. It started mm -hmm. again, like the workers' housing. So I think it's, it might be a, an important thing because I was thinking when you presented this, I don't remember Villa Arosio, maybe the, for the model, mm -hmm. because I, I was thinking that you 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 put some seven eight other examples like including Gardella etc. Yes. So these are again all architects. So what makes the difference from Villa Mania again an architect's expression and authorship is clearly there. What makes it to transform to a model which is available or affordable and accessible mm -hmm. to anyone? So is it really the question of land because this? I had the chance by through a summer mm -hmm. school visit yeah. Villa Saracena oh, and the neighboring, and it's yeah. really amazing. And it's in in other mm -hmm. because we were visiting first Il Girasole in Rome, this Palazzina, and then this yes, it's really a great architectural work in that sense. But the land is very small, as Maria said, mm -hmm. it's really tiny. Think, so yeah, it's an yeah. important question yeah. I think, for the team. Thank you for. Thank do you. I have one minute? No. Yeah, thank you, Watson. Um, it's a no, thank you for the question because actually I, I was reading the book. Uh, it's not really an easy read, I have to admit. Um, the Urban Scandal by Fiorentino Sullo because it really goes into detail all the legislation he would propose. And at one point, he quote Bernoulli about the fact that actually, yeah, the parceling of agriculture is what really then caused, or you know, the the sort of small size plots is then linked connected to like the the final size of plots and then therefore the type of architecture so there is definitely there uh, an answer to <clears throat> sorry the moment in which uh, the change of ownership happens uh, and i guess every i have six villas in my as case studies and i guess every every context is quite different but i'm hoping to uh, find more information about the specifics and maybe 
that will become the uh, as you suggested the link i think there yeah it's a, it's a great comment okay thank you